Our reading tonight, 1st Peter chapter 1, we are going to read from verse 13 up to verse 17, verse 13 to 17. Let us pray. Lord, we can also ask tonight, amazing love, how can it be? But thou, O God, would die for me. What a wonder of love and of grace that you left your eternal home to become human flesh, to be treated in a very evil and bad way, rejected by men, to die on the cross so that we can be saved, that our imprisoned spirit can be set free, that we can know the joy of being pardoned, that we can know the joy of being friends with God, to have you as our Father, to live by grace, to live in Christ, Thank you, Lord, for the wonder and the marvel of your grace. And as you call us, Lord, not only to be justified, but also to be sanctified. And as you call us to walk in your footsteps, to be holy, because it's the way of joy. It's the way of being completely what you called us to be. To be human as you has created us and to be a blessing to those around us and to the world. And we ask you, Lord, to guide us and to teach us. We really only want to come and sit at your feet. Give us a humble heart. Give us ears not only to listen, but to hear. And give us a desire to be willing to change. Let us, Lord, be willing to put our lives into the hands and the guidance of your Spirit, your Holy Spirit, Spirit who really wants to transform us into the image of Christ. Lord, we only confess that we so often sin and we are so far from what you want us to be. But we ask you, Lord, to guide us and to lead us and in such a way to be exalted. Be with us tonight as we open your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Therefore prepare your minds for action, be self-controlled, set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Christ, Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. So far the reading of the word. We have seen in this first chapter of Peter is writing to the persecuted Christians. Uh, they were in a very difficult situation. But he was encouraging them and reminding them that they were the elect of God. They were chosen by him. They were chosen to be heirs um, of, of, of um, all that God has promised. Um, but all that God, God has promised them. And uh, that inheritance... Uh, they will receive, God is protecting it for them. He's keeping it from them. No one can take it away from them. Maybe while they were, were on earth and they were persecuted, their um, possessions were taken from them. But God's inheritance, that they will receive because they belong to Him, they are part of His family, no one will ever be able to take it from them. And he spoke about the wonder of His salvation. The wonder of what it means and we can never depart from that. That's why when you sing this hymn, how can it be, or can it be? It's, it's marvelous 
over a thousand tongues to sing with old hymns of, of the salvation and the wonder of salvation. And the Christian can never depart, depart from that. He's always and daily, he wants to hear and preach the gospel to himself because it's, it's just a wonder. But it also means that when you become a Christian, there's also something that changes in your life. You cannot be the same. You are not only saved from the guilt of sin, but salvation also means that you are saved from the power of sin. And so many times when people maybe preach the gospel or hear the gospel, they only think, now I am saved from sin, Jesus died for me. And so they sometimes believe they can just continue as they did in the past, as if nothing uh, has changed greatly, so, but that is not the gospel. You are saved from the guilt of sin, you are forgiven, but you are called to, to change and to be a disciple of Christ, to follow in his footsteps, because you have been created, a new person, you have received a new nature, you cannot be the same. And if you stay the same, you've never been born again. Because if you receive the new life from Christ, and I think maybe one of the great things the world has it against the Christian church, that they say, why must we change? Why must we be converted? Why must we go to church? Why must we believe the gospel you have in your hands if there is no change in your life? If there is no difference? So the church should be an example. And everyone who calls themselves Christians should be an example of this changing power of the gospel. If it is not there. It's like a fruitless branch. It's dead. It's dead. It's really dead. The life of Christ is not there. Because where Christ is working. Through his Holy Spirit. People will change. And people will become holy. They will become different. And you can go through the history of the Christian church as well. Um, when they had the greatest impact on the world. It was when they were different, true disciples of Jesus. And Peter is calling on them, encouraging them as persecuted believers to follow in Christ's footsteps, reminding them that they have to prepare their minds for action as a soldier, take up um, the robes, bind it together as a soldier to be ready for action. To use their minds to be self-controlled. To put their hope fully on the grace that will be given in Christ when he's revealed in his second coming. Now we've seen, we've seen in verse 14, as obedient children. That he characterized the, the Christians. That's their character. They are obedient children. Not disobedient children. And he calls on them. Do not conform, in verse 14, to the passions of your former ignorance. He's mentioning here the negative part of true holiness. The apostle wants us to separate from the evil passions, from the desires we had in the past. It's a normal name the Bible used. To all sinful desires of the heart. It includes all the habits that pollutes us from the inside. And the Apostle John, when he is speaking about this world and the evil desires, he mentions the three branches of this anti-God um, world worship in 1 John 2 verse 15. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh... The desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. When you look at the world, when we think about the desires we have and the sinful desires, it is that of the flesh. You see it everywhere. It controls people. The desires of the eyes, the pride of life, the greatness of this world, we rather serve and worship the creation than we serve the creator. 
So the unconverted person is nothing under other than almost a den of impure desires, of pride, of uncleanness, of, 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 of selfish uh, uh, desires. It, it rules the selfishness in your heart. It's all about you. That's the culture of today. The selfie culture. It's about me. And that rules and regulates everything some people are doing. We read in Ephesians 4, the 17 to 19. And now this I say and testify in the Lord. That you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. In the futility of their minds. It's reminding them. When you were Gentiles. There was a fruitlessness, a futility in your minds. You, 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 you were going nowhere. They, they were darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. And they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensual greedy and practice every kind of impurity. If you look at the world today, it has become uh, custom and people are even full of pride about the impurity and the wrong things and it's getting worse we live in the time with impurity things that 10 or 20 years ago would have been shocking is now acceptable we just go through we just accept it Augustine said if people had their eyes opened they would find their position so terrible as living in a house full of snakes and serpents. And the first part of conversion is to rid us from the inside of, of these things that dwell in us. It's naturally part of us. And the apostle is saying to the believers that these evil desires were theirs. They lived in it. And, and they lived in it because of ignorance. Ignorance. And it's implied here that, that all sins come from some kind of ignorance. Uh, but people turn their mind against the light. They don't, and, and we see it today as well. We see it when Jesus came to this world. They loved darkness more than light. And it's the same today. People turn themselves, but they, they, they like the darkness, they like the in ignorance. They like these works of darkness because we don't like the light. And if the light of God is really shining upon us, it, it will show us how terrible sin is. I don't think we define sin maybe in that way in these days. We, we don't know how terrible, but you can go to all the wickedness in this world. The root of it is sin. Look at the racism you find in, in different countries. The hate varies. The killing of people. Lying, stealing. It's sin. And it's getting worse. And with all our education and all our cleverness, we are unable to control it. And the world, people will, will almost destroy one another because of hatred or whatever. It, and it is sin. It's the result of sin. That is the human heart. Because they don't want to accept the light of God. And human wisdom is insufficient. It's insufficient. That's why salvation is not by education but by revelation. And Paul is speaking to um, the Jews as well. And he's saying to them, you had knowledge of God's law. But that did not enlighten you. That did not renew your heart. You stayed in ignorance even though you had the law of God. And Peter writes to the Jews who knew the law. And who were taught, were taught in it before their conversion. And yet he calls them that those times when Christ was not known to them. A time when they lived in ignorance. And therefore he's calling them in verse 15 and 16. This wonderful verse. But just as he who called you is holy. So be holy in all you do. For it is written. Be holy 
because I am holy. It's just a tremendous calling that the, the eternal God, the creator of the universe, of all things, who have made us his children, that we can belong to him, ask us and call upon us to be holy as he is holy. What a tremendous privilege. The positiveness, calling believers to be like God himself. That's the positive behavior he's asking from us. Jesus says in Matthew 5 verse 48, Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. He's calling us to holiness. And he tells us in Peter, he's telling them that before they were heading uh, in their lives of sin to destruction, and then they heard the gospel preached, the wonderful gospel. And it spoke to their hearts and it called them back on that way of death to a way of holiness. And, and the way of holiness is the only way of life. It's the only way of life. And that must be the driving force in a Christian's life as well. To strive for sanctification. To strive for holiness. Christ separated those who belong to him from this world and picked them out to be a jewel for him. Exactly what he did to Israel. He took them out from the other nations so that they can be his people. It belongs to him. And he's equipping them for that. And when people, Peter is using these words, he's only almost repeating what has been said in the Old Testament. He's quoting from the Old Testament. We read in Leviticus 11, verse 43 to 45, Do not render yourselves detestable through any of the swarming things that swarm. And you shall not make yourselves unclean with them, so that you become unclean. For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourself therefore and be holy, for I am holy. And you shall not make yourselves unclean with any of the swarming things that swarm on earth. For I am the Lord who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God. And thus you shall be holy, for I am holy. That is the motivation. You, will be, you, you were elect. You were saved for a purpose. And it's the same with Israel. They were saved. God brought them out of Egypt to be His people. The nations around them were wicked. They sacrificed children. They were wicked. Terrible, immoral people. But God says, you must be my people. You must be different. You must be like me. And you must be identified with God. And, and, and the question is for us as well. Are, are the church, and we who call ourselves Christians, are we different in the way we think and do things? Or is the same things that are prevalent and the sins that are prevalent in the world is also in the church and sometimes it's more. It, it cannot be like that. There must be a difference. Jesus said to his disciples, and your, in your love for one another, they'll see that you are my disciples. To be different. But where is the love? You see struggles. You see differences. You see jealousies. You see hate amongst Christians. How must the believer respond to that calling? They must respond with reverent fear. And it's for me wonderful to see from this morning how this subject is almost like a red line from this morning to tonight. And I've never planned it like that. And maybe God wants to tell us something. Maybe he's speaking to us. And I hope there's some ears that will listen to that. But Peter is telling them that the link to the believer's obligation to respond to salvation in hope and holiness is the responsibility to honor God. To have reverence for God. To have the fear of God in their hearts. The respect towards God. 
is the command in this sentence. He's calling the persecuted Christians, saved ones, to have reverence for God. Hope and holiness produce a life of worship. If you have this hope, Christ will be revealed. He's going to come again. I've been called, I've been saved, I live in the wonder of salvation. And, and that brings worship in your heart. Proverbs 9 verse 10. Almost the same as chapter 1 verse 7 of this morning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. That is the beginning. That is what he's calling them to. The word fear signifies here the fear and wisdom. The beginning of it um, is, is the beginning of wisdom and the progress and the increase in that uh, life is also an increase in wisdom. So a godly person know wisely the truth and they know that sin is the greatest of all evils and the reason for all other evils and difficulties in this world. And therefore, they have a fear for that. You know, we, we fear many things in this world. But the Bible calls us to fear sin. To fear sin. To fear it, to, to go and transgress against God's law. And this fear knows that breaking the law provokes the just anger of God and the punishment of God. And the more a Christian believes and he loves God and he rejoices in his love, the more reluctant they are to displease God. And therefore Peter is also telling them that um, he's your father, but also he's the judge. He's the, he's the father. We have seen it in the Lord's Prayer as well. Jesus taught us to pray our Father in heaven. Paul affirmed that legacy in Galatians 4 verse 6 because you are sons God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts crying Abba Father. So it's appropriate for us to call God our Father. But Peter did not want believers to forget that though they have an intimate relationship with their heavenly Father they must conduct themselves in holiness during the time of their stay on earth because God is also the one who will impartially judge according to each one's work. He's your father, but he's not your buddy on your, on your level. He's the judge. And as long as people live on this earth as believers, God is keeping record of their works. You cannot live just as you wish. That's why you have the fear of God in your heart. And how will he judge? He will be impartial. Each man's work impartially. He won't say to the rich, you know, I, I just excuse you a bit, you gave a lot to the church, you know. Uh, I'll overlook some of your deeds. He, he's not doing that. He's not the one uh, going to say the one with a lot of degrees. You're clever, you I've done a lot of work for me and uh, did a lot of charity work. You are better than that other person. I'll overlook all your sins and all your desires that you left out here. No. When we stand before God, we are on the same level. If you are from the middle of Africa or India or China, or Europe, or wherever you are, if you are rich, if you are poor, if you are cultivated or not cultivated, before God, He will impartially judge us. And that is a cause to have fear. He's not going to look to some people and say, you are a minister in the church, hmm? uh, and then I will overlook some of those things you did. No, it's on the same level. You are a member or whatever, it's all the same. Psalm 119, David, he so often delighted in the hope and in God and rejoiced in God. But he all also say, my flesh trembles for fear of you and I'm afraid of your judgments. Psalm 6 verse 1, 
O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. He knew about that. So we care about what God thinks about our life. And therefore, there must be that fear. Paul knew something about that as well, calling the Philippians also to sanctification. Philippians 2 verse 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work according to his good pleasure. Isn't it therefore for a Christian, as we live day by day, to think about it? God's eyes is upon my life. When I'm alone, when I'm amongst people, when I'm at work, when I'm in church, and he sees me. See my heart. He, he knows everything about me. And he will impartially judge about uh, my life. We could ask the question, doesn't love drive out all fear? Now the Bible says that. Love drives out all fear. Is there fear in salvation? Assurance is certain, even when we as Christians are weak, no? and we sin, and we do things that are wrong. But if a person has no fear of sinning, there is no truth in their assurance. We are weak. We do things that is wrong. We confess that before God. But if you do not fear sin, there is no truth in, in thinking or being assured that you can live just like that. We want to think about is God. Isaiah 8, verse 12 to 13. He's putting the earthly and God's fears in the opposites. Do not call conspiracy all that this people call conspiracy. And do not fear what they fear, do not nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, Him you shall honor as holy. Let Him be your fear and let Him be your dread. We fear many things in this world that can happen to us, sicknesses, war. Isaiah says, don't fear what they fear, what is all around you, what is part of their culture. Maybe you fear financial wreck or whatever. He says there is one thing that you need to fear. And that is God. You need to dread Him. Because if you are at peace with Him, you have everything. But if He is against you, that's terrible. Jesus said the same in Luke 12, verse 4 to 5. I tell you, my friends, my friends, He's not speaking to them. And believer. Do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom you have to fear. Fear him who after he has killed has authority to cast in hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. That was the drove many of the martyrs in the past and the Christians to go all the way, to, to lose everything. For the sake of Christ. Because they feared God more than everything, anything else. They lived in his presence. So we can have confidence. As Christians. Knowing that we belong to the Father. And that. We can also know that we live before him. He will judge us one day. And we are. As the last part of this verse tells us. Live your lives as strangers. In relationship to this world, we are strangers. And yes, because, yes, because and, and especially because of that, we live with this continual, reverent fear of God. We respect God. Solomon says in verb, Proverbs 28, verse 14, Blessed is the one who fears the Lord. Always. Isn't it wonderful? Blessed is the one who fears the Lord always. It's always respect for God. But whoever hardens his heart will fall into calamity. Mm -hmm. Should fear God when we are with others, when we are in their own houses, and when we are in the house of God. We have lost that. Psalm 2 verse 11 says, Serve the Lord with fear 
and rejoice with trembling. First Peter 4 verse 17, I close with that verse. It is time for judgment to begin with the household of God, and if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel? True love and worship of God are marked by the understanding that He is the Christian's loving, gracious, generous Father, but He is also the holy, disciplining judge. And believers learn how to conduct themselves every day before His almighty presence. And that matters both in this life and in the life to come. Let us pray. Lord, we can only bow before you as we think about the call to live in reverent fear before you. And we must confess that even as a church we have lost much of it. We say what we like, we do what we like, we plan what we like. But open our hearts and minds, Lord, to see really who you are. As we remember the time when you revealed yourself to us as the Holy God and we have seen ourselves as sinners. We remember the time when we were imprisoned by our own evil desires and that we, we heard the message of salvation that we can be set free, that we can be unbound. That we, we remember the time when we were shook around by the devil and his works, were under his mercy. But you came, and by your calling, and by your election grace, you've called us to be part of yourself. And you called us, not by our own works, but by grace, and you, you said, follow me, follow me. But we ask you, Lord, as, as we walk every day, help us, as Peter reminds us tonight, to leave behind the life we've lived before in our evil desires, when we were ignorant, and help us, Lord, to live in this respectful, reverent fear of who you are so that we can have the complete joy of knowing that you are our Father and that we belong to you. We ask it in your name. Amen.